So please welcome Anand Subaran from Delight with a big round of applause. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, uh, thank you, Utaji, for uh, inviting us for uh, you know putting together this uh, workshop for the purposes of all the uh, members and practice and members in industry. And it's a great privilege to present the uh, topic on financial instruments, uh, uh, you know, to you today. And thanks so much for coming over on a Saturday uh, to you know, listen to this uh, workshop. Uh, as an introduction, uh, you know, I'm a partner in uh, uh, Deloitte Haskins and Sales. I work out of Mumbai, and uh, predominantly my area of focus over the last 15 years have been audits uh, done out of India and done uh, outside India in IFRS and in US GAAP. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, this has been a familiar territory when Indias came through. Uh, I also specialize in financial instruments and in consolidation and uh, any related consultations yeah, which comes through within the firm uh, essentially comes through, uh, you know, uh, a group of partners and a group of uh, senior managers and directors whom we work with. So, uh, Mr. Ramesh, uh, uh, you know, we all know uh, Mr. P.R. Ramesh very well. So, he gave me an opportunity to present this uh, in, in front of you. So, I grabbed this opportunity and uh, here I am. Uh, just uh, a couple of uh, things which I want to announce uh, is, uh, you know, the topic on financial instruments is uh, quite lengthy. Uh, the reason being, uh, uh, you know, we are trying to cover uh, almost uh, 400 pages of guidance in a couple of hours uh, on financial instruments and therefore uh, you know when you feel that you know you want to understand this particular subject a little more when you start applying in your mind some of the concepts which we will walk through today uh, just give me a shout and then we can discuss or we can discuss once I have gone through the presentation in terms of what could be the practical challenges. So I leave it up to you in terms of what you want to do. Uh, it would be helpful if by a show of hands if you can tell me in terms of how do you want to go about because I am comfortable with either or. Uh, but the only thing is uh, you know I want to complete all the three specific topics relating to financial instruments in the next uh, two to three hours so that you understand what the concepts are go back and try to see in terms of how you want to apply that specifically to uh, you know the the topics or the issues which you would have and which you would face either in practice or in industry all right so with that uh, uh, i start off my uh, financial instruments workshop uh, what i have done is uh, i have broken down the entire topic on financial instruments into two pieces the, the first is INDIS 32, which essentially talks about what is a financial instrument. So it essentially gives definition of what is a financial asset, what is a financial liability, what is an equity, how do you then start, uh, you know, distinguishing between, you know, when I should classify something as an equity and when I should classify something as a liability. Correct? So that's all about financial instrument presentation. So presentation of a financial instrument in the balance sheet is covered by INDIS 32. The second aspect of financial instruments is essentially the classification, measurement and de-recognition of financial assets and financial liabilities. Correct? So how do you classify a financial asset or a financial liability? So that is covered as part of INDIS 109. The second aspect of INDIS 109 is impairment, the big hot topic on impairment. And the third hot topic as far as INDIS 109 is concerned is hedge accounting. And when do you apply hedge accounting? What are the type of financial assets? Uh, what are the type of financial instruments where you can apply hedge accounting? What are the types of hedging relationships, etc. What I have tried to do is, I have tried to ensure that you understand some of the things better. 
uh, via examples and therefore uh, you know I have put together examples in the in the pub, in the printouts which you have but I would suggest as of now don't go through any of that we would walk through each of that in some form or the other today when we are discussing and uh, let that let that remain as a concept when you when you go back and if you have any issues then you know my email address is always there and you can come back to me uh, all right so to give a bit of background on or some history on uh, financial assets uh, on on this particular topic uh, you know as you know uh, somewhere around 2008 uh, Lehman collapsed, right? And one of the things which was blamed for the collapse of Lehman, for the support which was provided by the US government to AIG, correct, was that the existing financial instrument standard under IFRS was not good enough to capture accounting losses and impairment when it should have got captured or when it should have got accounted and therefore when the losses started hitting through either Lehman or AIG or even if you take Royal Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland was essentially taken over by the UK government because it was supported by the UK government. A lot of companies either collapsed, a lot of banks collapsed in 2008 and one of the reasons which was blamed for all of this was not only reckless lending but also because the existing accounting standards did not capture the accounting losses or the impairment losses at the time it should have got captured and as usual at that point in time the G20 came together and they said that you know, we need to rewrite the accounting standards as far as financial instruments is concerned. And that's when the entire project on IFRS 9 started. The reason why I'm going back to IFRS is because INDAS has got a history of IFRS. So that's when IFRS 9 started. And IFRS 9 was taken down into three phases. The first phase was the recognition and measurement phase for financial assets and liabilities. So that phase got completed in 2011. The second phase when they started rewriting the standard was on impairment. And the third phase which started simultaneously was on hedge accounting. By the time they completed each of the phases, hedge accounting got completed first before impairment. And Finally, they finished off writing the standard on impairment somewhere in the beginning of 2014 and that's when the entire standard on IFRS 9 got notified. This IFRS 9 standard is applicable for periods beginning 1st of January 2018. All right. Simultaneously, this project was supposed to be a joint project between the IISB which is the International Accounting Standards Board, the standard setting body of IFRS and FASB, the Financial Accounting Standard Board which was a standard setting body for US GAAP. They came together so that both these standards could converge. But at the end of the project, this standard never converged. ISB rewrote the complete standard, FASB did not rewrite anything. They said that the existing standards under US GAAP is good enough to capture losses when it needs to occur for the purposes of accounting and therefore we will not change any of these. Right? Now, in 2011 when NDAS was introduced, at that point in time, there were also exposure drafts pertaining to AS 30 and 31 which was introduced by the institute and which were similar to IAS 39 which is got replaced by IFRS 9 and IAS 32 
which remains the same as it was under IFRS and now is represented by something called as INDAS 32. Now what the institute has done when they have notified the standards now in December is they have said that instead of adopting IAS 39 or the equivalent which is called INDAS 39 or the old AS 3031 exposure drafts, what we would do is we will early adopt the new standard. And therefore, if companies are falling under phase 1 for the purposes of INDAS which is 31st of March 2016, the comparators which is 31st of March 2015 and the opening balance sheet which is 1st April 2015, all of this would be under INDAS 109 and INDAS 32. And therefore, similar to the revenue recognition standard which we are hoping would get deferred, this standard would be early adopted before Europe adopts these standards. As of now, the European Commission's recommendatory body, EFARG, has given a sort of a recommendation to the European Union saying that this standard is alright and therefore even though this standard has been introduced by the IASB, it is still not adopted by the EU. So for companies who are reporting under IFRS in the European Union, unless and until it is adopted by the EU, EU or the European Union, it is not effective. So it is just a recommendation which is gone from EFARG to the European Union and we hope that this would be effective on the same date when IISB wants it to be effective which is 1st January 2018. But as far as India is concerned, we are going to adopt this standard from 1st January 2015 because the opening balance sheet would need to get recasted on 1st January 2015. And therefore from that perspective, people and participants who are members in industry and members in practice would need to understand this standard and would need to apply the standard and the time period which is available is very short because by 30th June 2016 for the purposes of listed companies you would need to set, prepare a set of financial statements under INDAS with a comparator of 30th June 2015 and therefore you are hard you are looking at a time period from now which is May till 30th of June 2016 to understand this standard and to decode some of the concepts which has been given in this standard. So that's that's essentially a bit of background in terms of how this standard has come about in IFRS and how this is being introduced by the ICAI. Alright, so with this what I would do is if you look into the topics which we are going to cover for INDAS 32. We will start out with some of the key definitions which has been laid out in INDAS 32. Right? Then we will go into recognition of financial instruments. Then we will talk a bit about derivatives and what is a derivative. Then something which is very important and which you may encounter possibly in a majority of the financial statements is when do you classify a financial instrument as either a liability or an equity and what are the guidelines which has been specified in India S32 for classifying such financial instrument as a liability or an equity. Then we talk about accounting for compound financial instruments. A compound financial instrument is where an instrument is got characteristics of both an equity as well as a liability and therefore you would need to split the instrument into two when you initially recognize that instrument and then account for it at initial recognition and that's that's what is called as a compound financial instrument. Then we talk about interest, dividend and shares and in terms of if the underlying instrument is an equity then it would become a dividend if the underlying instrument is a liability even though it could be legally in the form of a dividend it could be classified as interest in your statement of profit and loss. We talk about treasury shares we talk about offsetting. So that's pretty much the agenda as far as INDAS 32 is concerned and let's look into what are the key definitions.
it's very important to remember that for a financial instrument you need to have a contractual arrangement with a counterparty let's assume that i am selling goods right to you company a is selling goods to customer b and therefore there is a contractual arrangement for entity a to collect cash from customer b and therefore that contractual arrangement converts itself in the balance sheet into a trade receivable and therefore trade receivable is a form of financial asset and if you look into counterparty b there is a contractual arrangement to pay to that counterparty b to entity a and therefore it becomes a trade payable for customer b so it is very important to identify that for you to classify something as a financial asset or a financial liability or a equity the first and foremost thing which you need is a contractual arrangement between two counterparties and therefore a contractual arrangement could result into a financial asset for somebody and for the other person it could be a financial liability like a trade payable or it could be a equity for example you are invested in shares of a company so for the person who is invested it is a asset and for the person who is given the shares it could either be a liability or it could be a equity so that's essentially what a financial instrument is you take an example of a derivative bank is return a forward contract right and therefore for the bank it could be a payable or a receivable and for the other party who has taken that forward contract and accepted it it could either be a receivable or a payable correct so that's the fundamental definition of what a financial instrument is and that's something which is important as you start decoding some of the complex rules which has been specified in terms of liability or equity classification which we'll discuss in some time from now all right so what are examples of a financial asset cash is a financial asset right equity instrument of another entity for example i hold ordinary shares in tata steel as an investor so for me it's a financial asset a contractual right to receive financial asset from another entity in this case a receivable right to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities with another entity under conditions that are potentially favorable to the entity in this case if the derivative is in a gain position it could be a financial asset for me right so that's what that definition is and the last an important one over here is a contract wherein i enter to receive a fixed amount of shares for a fixed amount of cash and what does it mean by fixed amount of shares for a fixed amount of cash let's assume i enter into a forward contract today right i enter into a forward contract today to purchase from company b 100 shares at 200 rupees a share okay so in one year's time i enter into a forward contract to purchase 100 shares at 200 rupees a share so my quantity of shares which i am going to purchase in one year is fixed which is 100 shares and the amount which i am going to pay to purchase that shares which is 100 multiplied by 200 is also fixed and therefore that also becomes a financial asset which i would need to record in my financial statements and therefore 100 multiplied by 200 is the total amount of cash which i am going to pay which is fixed and the amount of shares which i am going to get is also fixed which is 100 hold on to the accounting don't don't go to the accounting as of now let's just probably if you're thinking about accounting in terms of how do you account for it let's 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 reserve that to some time from now 
I'm just explaining what a concept of a financial asset is, right? If I go down further, so any questions on financial asset? If I go down to financial liability, a contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial instrument. So for example, a trade payable is a financial liability, right? Where a derivative is in a liability position. In a forward contract, when I fair value the derivative, the derivative is in a liability position. And therefore, as of the reporting date, if I have to cancel that contract, I would need to pay cash. And therefore, that becomes a derivative liability. And therefore, it becomes a financial liability. Right? A contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instruments and is a non-derivative for which the entity is or may be obliged to deliver a variable number of the entity's own equity instruments or they may not receive a fixed amount of cash or another financial asset for a fixed number of equity instruments. Take an example. Okay. Tata Steel. Okay enters into an arrangement with the vendor whereby what it says is that I would deliver to you okay I would deliver to you 100 shares at the market price on that particular date so the cash which you are going to receive is it fixed and so it could be two situations delivering Tata Steel shares 100 shares on a particular date and therefore it becomes a forward contract or the other party may exercise to purchase that share okay if Tata Steel shares essentially exceed 500 rupees per share so if Tata Steel shares exceed 500 rupees per share then the other party may exercise the right to purchase Tata Steel shares at 400 rupees. Right? So there are two situations. In the first case, my obligation to deliver shares, is it fixed? Yes. Is my obligation to receive cash, is it fixed? It is not, right? It is variable. So once one of the elements in the entire contractual relationship becomes variable it automatically goes into a liability classification because as of today when i enter into the contract i don't know how much cash i'm going to receive for the shares which i'm going to deliver and therefore that contract becomes a financial something which you are not heard about under the existing gap and therefore it's very important to understand the concept the second part is where i enter into an option contract whereby the holder can exercise the option to pick up tata steel shares 100 or 100 quantities of shares any time when the price goes above 500 right so what i have done is i have written an option whereby if you issue convertible debentures and if the price is not fixed yes it would become a liability yes we will discuss about convertibles in some time from now but yes the reason why it would become a liability i'll explain in some time from now so let me first understand explain the concept and then i'll go directly into your question in this case where there is an option contract Again, the holder has got an option to exercise that that amount or that 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 option at any time. The price go above 500, and therefore it is beneficial for him to go and purchase that shares at 400 rupees a share. And therefore, even though the market price on that particular day could be 600, what I am going to receive is something which is 400. And therefore, it is not fixed for fixed, and therefore it becomes a liability. So coming back to the question of convertible debentures, okay? 
how does a convertible debenture operate what is what are the two main conditions in the convertible debenture first is the company issues a debenture correct and what happens is when it issues the debenture let's assume the face value of each debenture is 100 rupees this debenture okay can be converted into equity shares of that company by the holder not by the issuer okay any time from the date of issue or from the second anniversary of the issue take any example up to the maturity period of the debenture let's assume in this case is 5 years okay at x price per share now what you are actually looking at over here is you are actually looking into a compound instrument an instrument which earns you interest till the time you hold that and which also gives a sort of a warrant to you to convert that face value of that debenture into equity shares at any time you want from the second annuary to the fifth annuary and therefore in this case you are essentially looking at two parts if the price is fixed and the amount of shares which is going to get converted based on the face value of the debenture is also fixed then at inception you are looking at two instruments the first instrument is a liability and the second instrument is nothing but an equity and therefore at initial recognition the total amount would need to be split into two parts for you to account so we will talk about compound financial instruments in some time from now all right remember one thing for you to bifurcate the instrument is you need to identify whether an instrument is a liability or an equity at initial recognition the time you purchase right or the time you enter into a contractual relationship and the determinative factor in terms of identifying whether an instrument is a financial instrument a financial liability or a equity is at the time of initial recognition unless and until the terms in the contract change after the initial recognition so it cannot be revisited later so irrespective of whether that instrument is traded not traded etc etc you always go back to the contract to see what is there in that contract unless and until that contract itself is something which is uh the the conditions in the contract is not something which is wholesome Yeah, yeah. So hold on to your question for some time. I'm just going into the concept of what is a financial asset or a financial liability. All your questions will get answered at a time when you have the determinative factor in terms of whether the financial instrument should be classified as equity or a liability. Correct. Pardon? If if both the things are fixed it would become a equity either a contract is a derivative contract or not a derivative contract in this case a contract to purchase shares a forward contract to purchase shares is not a derivative but a option contract to purchase shares is a derivative but either of those either the monetary consideration or the number of shares if either of them is not fixed you will go into the liability domain so hold on to the moment in terms of once it goes into you know a liability domain okay what are the type of instruments which can go into a liability domain and what are the type of instruments which can go into an equity domain so hold on to that discussion we'll we'll talk about it equity as you know is equity and therefore it, it represents nothing but the residual interest in that particular entity and it's that junior most 
tranche in terms of liquidation when you want to get shares from that particular or you want to get money from that entity and therefore it doesn't change definition from one gap to another gap as far as equity is concerned. An entity is required to recognize a financial asset or a liability on its balance sheet when and only when it becomes a party to the instrument's contractual provisions. So once it becomes a party to the contractual provision, then you start recording that particular contract in your statement of financial position with a corresponding impact either in P&L or other comprehensive income depending upon the guidance which is there in the standard. Once I sell goods, that is the time I will record the receivable. Once I have an obligation to pay cash, that is the time I will record a payable. Once I subscribe for an investment, that is the time I will record an investment. Once I issue equity shares and all conditions relating to issue of equity shares is satisfied, that is the time I will record my equity. Once I enter into a forward contract to purchase equity shares, that is the time I will record that equity shares in my balance sheet. Once I enter into an option contract to purchase shares and if the shares are not fixed for fixed, that is the time I will start recording that as a derivative. There are certain exceptions in terms of recording. The first exception is that let's assume, right? Let's remember that what is a financial contract is one where it has, it creates a financial asset for somebody and creates a financial liability for somebody, right? The first exception is, let's assume that I enter into a contract, forward contract to purchase 100 quintals of rice. So if I enter into a forward contract today to purchase 100 quintals of rice, and if I'm going to use that rice, let's assume in my trading business, for me, the entry I will record is, assuming I get the rice one month down the line, the entry which I will record at that point in time is debit inventory credit payable correct the other party would record credit sales debit receivable and that is the time when he is delivered on that contract and in this case even though it is a forward contract unless and until there is a loss in that contract i will not record that and therefore there is an exception to this that if you are purchasing a non-financial asset or delivering a non-financial, you know, or or you know, you are purchasing a non-financial asset. There is an exemption in terms of you record it once you have an obligation to deliver cash or receive cash, or unless and until at that point in time there is a loss which you need to record on that contract, and therefore it falls under AS 29 currently, and under IndAS it will fall under IndAS 37. All right, so how do you first measure a financial asset or a financial liability? The first measurement of a financial asset or a financial liability is always at fair value, which in majority of the cases would be the transaction price. But in certain cases, a financial asset or a financial liability could not be at a transaction price on original recognition. The reason I want to stress this point is, let's assume you are selling a receivable or you are selling goods. The day you are recorded the receivable, that is the fair value of the receivable. That is the amount which I am going to get, right? The day I am purchasing, the amount which I am going to pay is the fair value of the payable. The day I am issuing debt, that is the fair value of the liability. The day I am subscribing for an investment, either a debt or an equity, that is the fair value of that financial instrument and therefore, 
in a majority of the cases fair value is equal to the transaction price which i have paid but in certain cases fair value on the date of initial measurement will not be equal to the transaction price it could happen when the other party is selling it on a distressed sale basis although rare or it could be a transaction between two related parties or third is there could be some other factors which could cause the fair value not equal to the transaction price let me give you an example you remember two years back the price went to 70 rupees per dollar right as of now the price is 64 it was hovering around 60 61 to a dollar for a long long time and then two days back it went to 64 two years back it actually went up to 70 correct the reason was twofold the oil price is increasing and other factors which caused the rupee dollar exchange rate to go to 70 and since india is an import driven economy rbi intervened now what rbi did at that point in time let me let me give some facts in terms of what rbi did at that point in time so what rbi did is the immediate thing which rbi needed to do at that point in time was to bring the exchange rate down to something which is considered to be okay and therefore they were expecting to bring the exchange rate down in the short period to at least 64 63 now how do you bring the exchange rate from 70 to 64 63 so that was the biggest question so the rbi then introduced a scheme if are all of you aware of foreign currency non resident deposits fcnrb deposits so the rbi introduced a scheme of fcnrb deposits and asked the commercial banks to take deposits from nris now what the bank said at that point in time is that if i take a deposit let's assume at 4% interest rate or 5% interest rate and fcnrb deposits are placed in usd and given back in usd to the depositors if i take a deposit at 4% 5% that's not my only cost the cost is also the interest rate curve between inr and usd and the interest rate curve for a year is approximately 7 or 8% so if i take a forward contract now at 64 which is going to mature let's assume one year down the line the amount which i would need to pay is 64 plus 7 or 8% because dollar is trading at a premium and therefore it didn't make economic sense for the banks to take fcnrb deposits because there was enough liquid cash in the system in india where if they are taken a one year deposit the amount which they would have paid is approximately 8% whereas the total funding cost would be not more than 12 or 13% including the fx exchange rate movement which they have to factor i am talking only about the forward rate movement i am not even talking about the volatility in the forward exchange contracts so 12% versus 7% it didn't make economic sense the bank said no we are not going to do it rbi said fine what you do is you take deposits from depositors and immediately on taking the deposit you swap that for rupee deposits with rbi so you place a back to back dollar deposit with rbi and rbi instead of a 8% exchange rate movement between usd and inr which was the prevailing market rate of interest will charge you only 4% so what happened was even though the movement should have been 8% what you would need to pay to rbi when you purchase those dollar deposits back at the end of the maturity you need to pay only 4% additional not 8% and therefore if you look into that instrument at inception that swapping of dollar deposits into rupees and taking back rupees and selling rupees to rbi at the end of maturity and taking back dollar deposits is nothing but a forward contract as far as that bank is concerned and becomes a derivative and that derivative on day 1 if you value that derivative would have a fair value which is greater than zero because 
I have entered into a favorable contract as of today to get money at 4% whereas the existing price of that deposit is 8% and therefore there is a 4% gain up front. And therefore, in some cases the initial measurement may, if it is at fair value, it could result into a gain or a loss. So in this case, the banks had a day one gain because if I valued that derivative, that derivative would have had a fair value greater than zero. Where do I go and take the credit? Right? So in this case, based on discussions under IFRS, the credit was taken to deferred income because that credit would need to get amortized over the period of the deposit. And therefore, I am giving you an example of a case where transaction price is not equal to fair value on day one. And in that case, if you fair value, there was a gain, that gain got deferred and got amortized over the period of the deposit. So a live example of what could happen and how it fits into the definition of the standard. Right? Clear? Alright. So let's, let's look into some of the uh, Is a contract to buy a property from company B a financial instrument for company A and or company B? Any thoughts? The reason? Okay. Any other thoughts? All right, let's go into the second one. Let's all discuss everything together. Let's go into the second one. Is gold bullion a financial instrument? Yes, no. The reason why no is because he says it's commodity. As an investor, if somebody does it, it is a financial instrument. Pardon? Okay. Hold on. Defer tax assets? Okay. So you don't have any liability to pay when you have a gold billion. Okay. Uh, the third one, defer tax assets or defer tax liabilities? Okay. DPB, let's hold back. Non refundable supplier advances. Why? Okay. Hmm. Non refundable. Pardon? If it is refundable, yes, it is a financial instrument. If it is not refundable, then it is not a financial instrument. Okay? Hold on, hold on. Finance and operating lease arrangements? Security deposit can be non refundable as well. Correct. You need to understand why that advance has been given, right? Non-refundable supplier advance. Let me give you an example of a non-refundable supplier advance. Okay? Let's assume that uh, uh, Volkswagen comes out with a really, really good Beetle. Okay? And there is a big, big waiting time. Okay? And you go as a customer, Volkswagen says pay 10% advance. I will book your car now for delivery two years, two months down the line. Now once you have paid that advance, you are not going to get back that advance. What you are going to get back is a car and therefore it could become non-refundable. Yeah, Correct. When you adjust, 
okay what you are going to get is a car which is a non financial asset right and what you are going to pay is 90% of the price of the car which is still not completely done and therefore the amount at the reporting date of the 10% is not a financial asset but a non financial asset no you don't have to pay back what you are going to pay or what you are going to deliver to that customer as a car and therefore it becomes a non financial liability remember in your in day as financial statements you not only need to bifurcate current assets and current liabilities but also financial asset and financial liabilities and therefore understanding this concept is very important when you are trying to help clients map their chart of accounts or if you are clients redraw your chart of accounts based on the revised format yeah. finance and operating lease arrangements indias Yes, it's pure leasing. So, what happens to operating lease? Okay. And finance lease? Finance lease is a liability. Where do you show your finance lease payments currently under AS three or under your revised Schedule six? Where do you show it? No, but where do you show? Okay. So if you have to pay, let's assume for a finance lease arrangement, where in your cash flows would you show that amount which you would need to pay? Operating activity. Somebody said operating. AS three operating finance lease arrangements. No, I'm just talking about cash flows. Financing activities, right? So there is an inherent financing element in a finance lease arrangement because I am picking up something today which I am going to pay over several periods, and therefore not only I need to pay for the principal but also for the interest, and therefore the finance lease arrangements falls under a. financial liability and a financing asset for both the contra contractual parties all right forward contracts between an acquirer and an acquirer to buy an additional share within the scope of indias 109 you don't need to answer this if you are not gone through business combinations i'll tell you what the answer is it's essentially scoped out of 109 because it is covered under 103 that's the only reason gratuity okay it's not a contractual obligation okay so let's assume if you have your own trust then it becomes a financial liability If you, let's assume if I have to pay as per somebody's payment of gratuity act, then it becomes a. But I thought the both both the entities, right? Even though you have your own trust or you pay to a, you know, let's assume a trust which has been administered by the government. Now, so hold back, hold back your thoughts. Okay. Loan commitments. Okay. No. Okay. So let's go through the first one. The first is since it's a non-financial item which you are going to purchase, it is not falling under the definition of a financial asset or a financial liability. Remember, I gave you that exemption in terms of the 
exemption which is available for your normal purchase and sale requirements so that's why it's not the second is because gold is a commodity third is deferred tax asset is not contractual fourth is non refundable is there's no right to receive cash only goods would be received which is what our thought process was finance lease arrangements we discussed operating lease we discussed forward contracts between an acquirer and acquiree we discussed employee assets and liabilities even though it is contractual between the company and the employer between the employee this is covered specifically under indas 19 and therefore it is scoped out of the standard yeah and loan commitments would fall generally under indas 37 and will not fall under indas 109 unless and until these three conditions are satisfied the reason why it first falls under indas 37 is let's assume i am a bank i have written a loan commitment okay loan commitment is that i would give working capital limits and cc limits to customer b over the next 2 years for 2000 crores okay and this is a limit which i have given so at any point in time customer b can come withdraw from the working capital limits and therefore there would be an obligation to pay to that bank 2000 crores or whatever is the amount which is drawn from that 2000 crores so that that's what a loan commitment is but assume in the meantime that when i had given that right the borrower's credit rating was triple a and one year down the line because of whatever reasons the borrower's triple a rating reduced to a minus so in this case i need to understand at that point in time when the borrower is going to withdraw the money whether i am going to incur a loss and if i am going to incur a loss because he is not going to pay something then that loss first would be accounted under indas 37 which is equivalent to your existing indian gap standard which is as 29 and that's the reason why it first falls under indas 37 right Pardon? Only if the bank is obligated to pay the money, and there is a loss which is inherent when it pays the money. So, for example, let's assume you have a clause in the in the sanction letter. You have a clause which says that this loan commitment has been provided. subject to the condition that there is no deterioration in your credit rating so as soon as there is a deterioration in the credit rating banks have got a right to withdraw the loan commitment then that loan commitment still remains a loan commitment it doesn't come into the balance sheet so if i look into the arrangements which have been entered by banks currently they always have this clause so the indian banks are very smart they don't want to enter into this kind of an arrangement where by you commit for 2 years and your credit rating goes down or the borrowers or the customers credit rating goes down and therefore these clauses are always there or there will be a clause which says the bank has got a unilateral right to withdraw this sanction at any point in time they wish to and if it is legally binding on the other party once they sign on the dotted line we don't need to account for that loan commitment unless that loan commitment is fair value through profit or loss right yeah so it's similar to any other accounting right so let's assume that i am a parent and a subsidiary is taken a loan and i have given a essentially a guarantee to that subsidiary is banker saying that if the subsidy doesn't pay i will pay so it becomes a financial guarantee contract 
and when you will account for that financial guarantee contract is similar to loan commitment that is that if i foresee a loss in that contract that loss will get accounted for under indas 37 yeah given by me correct so even though i don't have a contractual liability i give a guarantee financial guarantee contract is a contractual liability a contractual liability to pay to the banker the amount which i need to pay and therefore when that guarantee devolves that is the time you would start recording that guarantee in your financial statement similar to under indian bank You are now, you are saying now you are entering into that. Yeah, so at that point in time, so once a party becomes, uh, once a customer becomes a contractual party to that contract, that is the time you will record that financial liability or an asset. So in this case, it is at that time when you enter into that contract and you find that subsidiary. That is the time. But when you restructure the advances, what you would do is you would record a provision, right? So where is the question of recording something else? Because the amount which you have recorded already is there in the balance sheet. Or the amount which you have paid is already there sitting as a loan. We'll talk about that in impairments. So let's not uh, let's not jump to impairment currently because that is related to impairment. It is, but since it is covered specifically and addressed specifically in India's 103, that is why it is outside the scope of this particular standard, right? Any guarantees, boss, any guarantee, any loan commitment, everything would come under, any, anything would come under the financial asset or a liability because it's contractual. The only thing which is not come is let's assume I have a sales tax receivable or let's assume I have a sales tax incentive which I need to recover from the government what I need to recover from the government is not contractual it is based on some schemes that answers your question on DPB right so it's not a contract between me and the government government has introduced a scheme that please come and set up shop in this particular region and if you set up shop in this particular region and if you export out of this region, you will get an incentive. And it is applicable not only to me, but to any customer or any company which comes and sets up shop in that particular region. And therefore, it is not a contractual relationship between that company and government. And therefore, those kind of arrangements are excluded from financial assets and liabilities and would be classified under current and non-current assets and liabilities depending on what you are as part of the contractual relationship. Okay, let me ask you a question. What do you do currently under Indian GAAP for bank guarantees? Conti the, the, why, why, is that, why is that a contingent liability? On the happening of future event, as of now, Let's assume I have entered into a bank guarantee contract, okay, a performance guarantee contract, wherein I would need to honor the performance obligations of somebody else. As of today, why will I record for that asset or a liability today? Unless and until somebody defaults on the obligation or if I expect that let's assume Kingfisher is going to go down the line, that is the time I will start honoring that obligation. So I will have to monitor the credit risk, similar to Indian GAAP. And then once I believe that there is an obligation which is expected to go out of that, 
that guarantee contract would first get accounted under India AS 37 or your existing now Indian gap which is AS 29. So even though it is a form of a financial guarantee thing, it will first get accounted under India AS 37. Right, let's uh, talk about derivatives. Uh, we have already spent an hour on concepts. Okay, we are not even moved to derivatives. I got 150 more slides to go. So, uh, so we'll we'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, I understand that import understanding concepts is something which is important. Uh, but let me talk about derivatives very quickly. Derivatives is something where, okay, the amount which you are going to receive or the amount which you are going to pay okay changes in reference to an underlying let's assume the amount which you are going to receive or the amount which you are going to pay in a forward contract changes in reference to the foreign exchange rates which is prevalent between usd and INR. so the underlying is the foreign exchange rate second is the changes the amount which I am going to receive or the amount which I am going to pay changes in reference let us assume to the interest rate benchmarks for example LIBOR or the amount which I am going to receive or the amount which I am going to pay depends on the LSC metal prices index because I am going to purchase copper or aluminium or steel right so any changes which is benchmarked to a reference change a market change where at the time when I have paid, I have to hardly pay anything or receive anything. The amount which I pay when I enter into that contract is close to zero. No initial net investment. Okay, And it is expected to be settled at a future date. It is called a derivative. So a derivative could be a derivative which a company enters into for let us assume hedging commodity price risks. A company which enters into a derivative or a forward contract to hedge foreign currency price risks, interest rate risks or it could also be derivative over its own equity shares. For example, we talked about forward contracts and option contracts, right? So those are some of the examples of derivatives. Right, this is, this is clear in terms of what a derivative is. Any questions? All right, let's come to equity and a liability classification. Okay. When do you classify something as liability and when do you classify something as equity? Very, very important and it's going to affect a lot of companies in India which have instruments which over around the equity and the liability classification. Okay. A liability is where a financial liability is where I have a contractual obligation to pay. Okay. And the second important definition or part of the definition of a financial liability is where there is an unconditional obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset then it becomes a liability so contractual obligation first definition and second is unconditional obligation to deliver cash so these two are the two most important elements of a financial liability classification so once you determine what is a financial liability then what is left out is nothing but equity so let's take an example Okay. I may not go through all these slides, but I will try to cover in some form or the other considering the time which we have. Let us take an example. Why do you classify preference shares currently under Indian GAAP? Equity. Okay. So let us take an example of a preference share. Okay. This is a convertible preference share. Okay. So let me take an example of a convertible preference share. So the terms of the preference share is that the face value of each preference share is 1000 rupees and I get 10% interest on that preference share. Okay. The 
amount which I am going to pay out as far as that preference share every year is 10% of 1000 and therefore it would be 100 every year. Correct? At the end of 5 years, okay, at the end of 5 years, the issuer, which is the company, has got an option to convert that preference shares into equity. If it does not get converted, correct, at the end of the 5th year, the preference shares compulsorily redeems. So, this is the term of the preference share. Right now, let us look into and analyze based on the definition. So, till the time of the fifth year, how much is the interest I would need to pay? 100 rupees every year multiplied by 5 and 500. Do I have an obligation to deliver cash? Can I deny delivering cash? It is a preference share. Okay, if you don't have profits, you won't declare dividend. Let's assume a cumulator. Assume it is cumulator. No, so assume assume no, assume it is cumulator. Exactly. You will pay only when you have profits. Is profits within your control? Correct? You have an obligation to deliver cash, correct? Can I control my profits? No. In this case, what would happen to that interest? I have to pay, right? So, I have an unconditional obligation to deliver cash. Can I deny cash? No, I can't. Profit is not within my control. And therefore, the amount of 100 multiplied by 5, which is 500, essentially is nothing but a liability. Correct? The second aspect is, you talk about the contractual provisions as far as principal is concerned. So, in this case, who has got the option to convert? Issuer. Correct? So, at the end of fifth year, let us assume that it does not have cash to pay. Can it exercise the option to convert? And if it exercises the option to convert, can it deny cash as far as principal is concerned of 1000? Yes. So, what happens at initial recognition as far as the principal itself is concerned? It turns into an equity. So, I can deny cash because it is within my control to convert. So, in this case, I have a compound instrument where the principal becomes a equity and the interest which I am going to pay becomes a liability. Let us take that example and say that assuming there are no profits, correct? Assuming there are no profits, at the end of 50 year, even this amount of 50, which is 5 years multiplied by 10, also converts into equity. Okay? Then what would happen? Still, is profits within my control? Fundamental aspect. No. So, that does not depend upon an event which is going to happen at the end of 5 years where I am going to convert. If let us assume there is profit, I need to pay. Correct? Let us flip the example. Let us assume that instead of the issuer having the option, the holder has got the option to convert. In this case, if the holder has got an option to convert, can the issuer deny cash? Then the entire instrument becomes a liability. So, clear on the concepts in terms of when it could become a liability and when it could become an equity. Right? Yeah? Correct. Correct. I how it can be called as equity. So let's. I have not. I have not put together examples in terms of at the end of five years, you know, thousand worth of debt is going to get converted. Let's assume at ten rupees per share. Then it becomes an equity. Correct. 
at thousand rupees per share let's assume okay at the price which is prevailing on that particular date then it becomes an entire liability because i don't know so i'm taking a simple example keeping in mind the earlier concept which you can't forget as far as this example is concerned okay so everything flows through what about the warrants pardon what is the share warrants what is a share warrant okay no so what are the terms of the warrant so it will go through the same criteria in terms of whether it is fixed for fixed or fixed for variable if it is fixed for variable it could become a liability it could become a liability and even in that case you need to ascertain whether it's a liability or a derivative liability and if it is fixed for fixed that warrant would be accounted as an equity correct Or, pardon? Correct. So you would account for it as a equity, and then say that these voting rights are not there, and therefore, accordingly, for the purposes of your earnings per share, you would need to evaluate and then conclude and give appropriate disclosures. Let's 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 come let's come to that. Okay, let's come to that. Don't we'll we'll address each of that. Okay, so the first example is entity A issues preference shares that are mandatorily redeemable at par in ten years. Is this a liability or equity? Clear liability. Okay. Entity A issued preference shares that are putable for rupees one million by the holders to entity A at any time after a specified date. Under the terms of the shares, entity A is required to satisfy its obligation under the put out of its distributable reserves. Does entity A have a contractual obligation to deliver cash to another financial asset? Not till the period. Okay. So in the period, will you change it from equity to liability? Does the contractual provisions of the instruments change? When do you start recording a financial asset or a liability at initial recognition? the initial recognition is when you become party to that contract okay can i deny cash just because there is no distributable reserves can i control my distributable reserves no what is the answer liability correct so this is what we discussed right no the entire instrument then becomes a liability if something is not put up then there would be a transfer at the end of the year when all the contractual obligations get discharged or derecognized from liability to equity at that point in time all right let's look into some complex ones all right so i am not explaining you what the concept is i'll go and explain the concept after you see the example okay entity b issues shares for rupees 1 million dividends are discretionary entity b must redeem the shares at par in the event of a flotation initial public offering of the entity okay he says equity the reason why equity okay entity b must redeem the shares at par in the event of a flotation of an ipo what does it mean pardon exactly so the question is whether i can have a successful ipo or not is it within my control 
So that is not within my control. But if I have to initiate a IPO or not, is that within my control? Yes. yes. So I cannot initiate an IPO and therefore I will not be able to redeem. I do not want to redeem. And therefore I can unconditionally deny delivering cash on another financial asset. And therefore this becomes a equity. Okay, take an example whereby entity B issues shares for rupees 1 million. Dividends are discretionary. Entity B must redeem the shares at par in the event an IPO does not happen by the fifth anniversary of the issue of shares. Exactly. So see how it changes based on what is there in the contractual provisions. So in this case, I need to redeem the shares in the event an IPO does not happen. IPO is not within my control. I don't know whether it's going to happen or not. If it is not going to happen by the fifth year, I need to compulsorily redeem. And therefore, I need to pay cash. And at initial recognition, therefore, the entire amount will be recorded as a liability. Yeah. Correct. Correct. But it is a separate entity. Not in pure in the subsidy. Correct. So who will who will decide whether it will remain a subsidiary or not? You will decide, right? Uh, you have answered the question. <laughs> All right. Clear? All right. Something which is similar to the perpetual bond, which uh, you know you're talking about, which Reliance issue. Let's. Do you know what is a perpetual bond? Okay. Let's talk about what is the feature of a perpetual bond. A perpetual bond is where there is no maturity for that bond, but every year the issuer must pay interest. So let's assume if there is no maturity, you must be wondering in terms of when do I pay that principal back. But let's assume that on a bond of 1000, I pay interest every year at 10% and therefore every year I pay 100. And if I start discounting that 100, which I pay every year from year one, let's assume to whatever year you want to take and discount it back at 10%, you would reach 100. Or thousand, and therefore the value of the perpetuity or the amount which you would pay over the entire period is equal to the present value of thousand at any point in time, and that's how your maths work. And therefore, that perpetual bond will be classified as a liability because the amount of interest which you would pay over the period would be equal to the present value of the bond or the face value of the bond today because it's perpetual in nature. So in this case, also similarly, it's a non-redeemable callable bond. But if the dividend is not paid, it increases from 5% to 25%, but ultimately at that point in time, something would need to get paid. And therefore, this is nothing but a liability. Yeah, so we need to understand how legally allowed or not. So these are examples which has been given in the standard. But as far as companies act is concerned, what can get issued will be under the reliance of the companies act, but it could be issued by a foreign subsidiary because financial instruments is applicable not only to standalone financial statements where companies act apply, but also to consolidated financial statements where companies, Indian companies act will not apply. And therefore we have seen cases where these kind of instruments have been issued by foreign subsidiary of major Indian entities.
Yeah, so what happens over here is it accumulates to 25%, but at any point in time, the amount of principal plus interest can never be paid out, and therefore it becomes an equity. So my, <laughs> so my understanding of what the uh, uh, example over here is that it is 5%, it becomes 25%, but at any point in time, the amount of 25% gets added on on a cumulative basis and it will never get paid because it is non redeemable So in this case, then it becomes a equity. Entity A writes an option to sell its equity shares in a listed entity B for rupees 5 per share at the end of a 90 day period. This is what we discussed, right? Potentially unfavorable as far as the company is concerned, and therefore it becomes a liability. All right, so this pretty much sums up your financial liability and equity classification. And if you look into what are the various scenarios, if these two are fixed, it becomes equity, otherwise, everything else becomes a liability. Compulsively convertible debentures. It depends on what the contractual terms are, but if the convertible debentures are to be converted at the option of the issuer, then it becomes a compound instrument. If the convertible debenture is converted at the option uh, of the older, then it becomes a liability. But in the majority of the cases, CCDs are where it gets converted to the option of the issuer. And therefore, there would be a compound instrument where the interest part which you need to pay up to the date the instrument gets converted becomes a liability, the remaining thing then becomes a equity. Correct. To be classified as a correct because it's a compound instrument it has characteristics of at initial recognition it's got characteristics of both liability and equity the interest is outgo and therefore it's a liability i can't deny cash it gets compulsorily converted and therefore the principal becomes a equity so so which brings aptly to the next topic of compound instruments and how do we do, do the accounting for compound instruments. So if you look into how do we do the accounting for compound instruments. So let us take the example of a convertible bond exactly what we are talking about. right? So the obligation to pay interest and principal is a liability, the equity conversion option is a equity. In this case it is a conversion option. In certain cases it could be a compulsorily convertible and therefore the principal itself could be a equity. So how do you then do a split accounting? The method in which you would need to separate is use your initial carrying amount of compound instrument as your starting point. So for example, in this case assuming the face value of the convertible bond is 1000, that is your starting point, 1000 rupees. right? Then what you do is you determine the fair value of the liability component. The fair value of the liability component is nothing but the amount which you have issued without the conversion option. So assuming you would have issued a convert bond, a plain vanilla bond without any conversion option, okay? what are you actually doing with the conversion option? By giving a conversion option to the holder, what you are essentially doing is you are saying that look, today I need cash, tomorrow when I start using this cash in my business, the value of my shares is going to go up and therefore, you know, five years down the line when you are going to convert this thousand rupees, you are going to get good shares and when I sell these shares in the market, I am going to make a big gain. So you are giving him a sweetener 
in terms of saying that you know don't ask for cash at the end of 5 years i'll give you shares that's a conversion option and in this particular case if you look into a conversion option or a convertible bond the interest on that convertible bond would be less than the interest on a normal bond without the conversion option right because i'm giving him a sweetener in the form of a conversion and assuming for a 5 year period the interest rate is 10% on a convertible bond probably the interest rate would be 5% and therefore what the standard says is when you are going to do a split accounting what you do is you split the instrument into two parts liability and equity but for the purposes of classifying something as liability what you do is you take a bond without the conversion option in this case 1000 rupees at 10% which is having a interest rate of 10% for each year and therefore the cash outflow is 50 right and if i had taken the conversion option the cash outflow would be nothing but 25 so 25 divided by whatever 10% would give me a a, a liability so that is the fair value of the liability and the residual then becomes a equity okay so in this case if i estimate the fair value of the conversion option is 9 12 the present value of the contractual cash flows is 90 and therefore what you do is you allocate the present value of the contractual cash flows of 90 to the liability and the remaining then becomes equity so the equity is nothing but the residual first you calculate the fair value of the liability right so this is again another example uh correct it's optionally convertible right so it's only the value of the option so in your case where it is compulsorily convertible the value of equity could go up so in the earlier case the convertible bond you are valuing only the conversion option so the value of the conversion option is 12 but where it's a compulsorily convertible the principal will also go into equity and therefore the value could go up yeah the standard says that once you have done an initial recognition of liability and equity equity once you have recorded something the equity do you change so the same principle prevails and therefore we don't change what changes is liability and liability changes because there could be an interest accretion to that liability so once you have done an initial recognition the equity value doesn't change so what goes as equity at 10 remains as 10 in the equity unless there is a contractual provision which changes the entire arrangement so the original agreement prevails the original arrangement prevails 90 will get recorded to liability 10 will get recorded to equity yeah so the valuation of the option part is let me let me take an example so i am not taking a compulsorily convertible debenture example i am taking a conversion option example so in the case of a conversion option the example is that the value the conversion option essentially is nothing but a option which has been given to the issuer uh, to the holder by the issuer which essentially says that you can convert 1000 rupees worth of bond at 10 rupees per bond right so the question is that if it doesn't get converted okay so the, the the amount which you would record to that particular option is how many people will convert and how many people will not convert and what is the fair value at inception of that particular bond and that fair value at inception which is 10 is what gets recorded to equity the remaining gets recorded to liability so that's where the valuation exam valuation things will prevail right what is the stock price today 
what is the stock price which is expected five years down the line what is the volatility how many people will convert how many people will not convert and that's where the valuation principles will come in and based on that but in this case if you look into the example the example is not that way around the example is first of all you will take the carrying value of 100 you will first calculate the fair value of the liability you don't calculate the fair value of the option because that could be a potential estimate which could be incorrect because of the reasons which you specified and therefore what you do is you take this as a residue so 100 minus 90 is equal to 10 rather than accounting for 12 as conversion option and then 88 as a value of the liability so that's the steps which has been given in the standard in terms of calculating what the residual value of the equity is no you can't right why will it why will it at initial recognition at initial recognition it won't change at initial recognition the amount is a price which you would pay for a normal bond without the conversion option that won't change after initial recognition it doesn't change so you don't keep on revaluing the fair value of the liability this split would need to be done at the time of initial recognition after that there will be only interest accretions pardon March 16, but first April 2015, you'll have to record for all of this. So your opening balance sheet is where you need to assess for all of this. If the contract expires, then no. But if the contract is live, you need to do the bifurcation. I am not going to go through this example. This example is pretty much similar to uh, what I have explained. So it's it's got all these solutions. So you can go through that. All right. Treatment of interest, dividend, gains, and losses. Pretty simple. If An entity has issued non-redeemable preference shares with discretionary dividend. How will this dividend be recorded? Where will this dividend get recorded? Pardon? So it's non-redeemable. And dividend is discretionary, which means I can pay or may not pay. And therefore, the treatment of that would be pretty much similar to how you would treat your normal dividends under equity shares. And therefore, this will get recorded under equity. So, it will never touch p &L. All right. So, interest is interest. You will record it to p and if dividend is paid with an instrument which is classified as equity then the amount would also then be paid unless and until it's a compound instrument right okay so let's now talk about transaction cost because something which is important is transaction cost okay entity b places its privately held ordinary shares that are classified as equity with a stock exchange and simultaneously raises new capital by issuing new ordinary shares in the stock exchange transaction costs are incurred in respect of both the transactions Determine the treatment of the incurred transaction cost. What do you do under section 78 currently? Section 78 is still applicable, right? Even under Companies Act 2013. So you reduce it from the cost of the equity. So you record those transaction costs as necessarily equity transactions and record it, reduce it from the cost of the equity. But there's a subtle distinction over here. The first part in the example is where I have shares and now I am placing those shares in the stock market which means I am going from unlisted to listed. And second is simultaneously at the same point in time I am also issuing new shares. So what the standard says is if you are issuing new shares and 
for that you are incurring transaction cost transaction cost could be due diligence fees lawyers fees auditors fees listing fees etc then those transaction cost you can reduce from the equity which means you can re reduce from your share, share premium or your additional paying cap but where you already issued shares and those shares you are trying to place it in the market now then there is nothing but an expense because it is not a new share which is issued and therefore you need to keep that distinction between when you are going for a market with a new share and when you are going for a market with an existing share right that will go as expense we need to see in terms of how this will interplay with the companies act because in companies act everything goes to including roadshow expenses etc etc right so even under the even under the new standard even under india s act the roadshow expenses also cannot go to because that is not incurred directly in relation to the issue of shares you are trying to market that for the purposes of some <coughs> Uh, for subscription etc etc and therefore roadshow expenses even if it is for issue of new shares will not go to equity it will go to expense under brand hmm if it if it qualifies to be an intangible asset yes as of now those expenses do not qualify to be intangible assets therefore it will all go to the bottom line treasury shares uh, currently the accounting treatment is to show that as investments but uh, treasury shares is essentially reduced from the equity share capital and that's how you would show treasury shares uh, as far as the presentation is concerned Yeah. So that is an example over here. The acquisition and subsequent resale by an entity of its own equity instrument represents a transfer between owners, rather than a gain or loss to the P&L. And therefore, it will never come to P&L. I don't know the legal uh, uh, legal angle of whether treasury shares is allowed or not, but it does happen between uh, uh, companies and ESOP trusts. Yeah, but it happens between yeah, but it happens between companies and ESOP trust, and ESOP trust is something which you need to consolidate, and therefore you have treasury shares over there. Yes, it's a structured entity, and therefore you consolidate the ESOP trust, and the ESOP trust holding your shares become a treasury share. So it comes through from that angle. Yeah, that's how that's how it normally happens. Offsetting uh, again, pretty much similar to what you have been doing before under Indian Gap. It's not going to change. So unless and until you have both a legal right of offset as well as an intention to offset, okay, then only you would be able to offset a financial asset and a financial liability in the balance sheet. <coughs> Otherwise, you have to show both the financial asset and the liability on a gross basis. So let me give you an example. Let's assume a bank has taken a deposit, and against that it's given a loan, loan against deposit, correct? So, how how does a bank show the loan, loans? How does a bank show the deposits, liabilities? Does it offset? Okay, it's got a right to offset, not on a full time basis, only when somebody defaults on the obligation, right? Not at the time when I originate the loan that i immediately offset only when a customer defaults at that time the right of offset is available so the important point to remember is correct yes they got a right but that happens only at the time of default correct but what this says is 
the right of offset should be available throughout right from the time i originated till the time the entire instrument is derecognized so in this case i don't have that right of offset from day 1 i have a right of offset that right of offset kicks in that kicking rights comes in only when there is a default provision happens when the obligating event happens of a default at that point in time the right of set off happens we are talking about a principal only swap principal only swaps under indian gap corporates have been treating it differently so they have not been revaluing it but as far as indias is concerned the fcnrb would be shown as a deposit and the interest rate swap which you have entered will be shown as a derivative it doesn't matter right Yeah, the evaluation is always done in the functional currency, not the reporting currency. Reporting currency is only for the purposes of presentation. Your your books of accounts are drawn based on the functional currency, not the reporting currency. All right, so let's uh, go ahead. Uh, easy concepts. I got some more concepts which are coming in, which may be difficult. Uh, <laughs> in days versus IAS. Differences which are there under India's 109 is if there is a foreign currency convertible bond under IFRS, that foreign currency convertible bond is treated as a hybrid instrument because it is not fixed for fixed in the functional currency. Whereas under India's, if it is fixed for fixed in any currency, then it is treated to be considered to be equity, and therefore that carve out has been given for the purposes of. in days which is not there in ifr as reason why that carve out is given is the equity market is not very deep in india and therefore a lot of corporates rely on debts and rely on fccbs for the purposes of conversion and therefore that request was made by corporates uh, which was taken accord by the institute and also by the mca and the nakas and therefore this exemption is there banks and insurance companies anyway don't need to adopt IFRS right in days, so for them still existing Indian gap would apply. So they are not within the phase one of the implementation. Either they are in the phase two of the implementation. So for banks, insurance companies, NBFCs, this carve out doesn't apply, or the entire in days doesn't apply. But if the NBFC is a subsidiary of a parent, and the parent is not an NBFC. We need to apply in the S for the NPF. <coughs> so if you have capital financing arms, then you will be stuck. Pardon? Yes, because there are capital financing arms. Mahindra has got a capital financing arm. Tata has got a capital financing arm. Everybody, a lot of companies have got a capital financing arm. Okay, so that. brings to the second topic of the day which is classification recognition and measurement uh all right so i'll first go into classification of financial assets I'll give you a couple of minutes to observe the slide uh and then let's discuss what this all means everything is there in this slide i don't need to explain anything else so once you have identified a financial asset or a liability i'm first talking about financial assets okay once you have identified it's a financial asset then you recognize the financial asset then you start classifying that financial asset so under indias there are three categories of classification the first category is at amortized cost the second category is fair value through profit and loss 
and the third category is par value through OCR. So these are the only three categories which is being specified in the standard. And this slide essentially talks about when you can classify something into what. Okay. So let's first take an example. Then you will be probably able to better understand this slide. Let's take an example. I have, okay, okay, I have a debt instrument, a government of India bond, okay, which carries interest at ten percent and the face value is thousand. I'm keeping keeping coming back to the thousand and ten percent through various examples. Uh, the reason why is because maths is easy. A government of India bond which carries interest at 10% with a face value of rupees 1000. Okay, is it a debt instrument? Yes. Okay. Let's assume that this company which is holding that asset, okay, wants to collect the contractual cash flows from that asset. What are the contractual cash flows from that asset? Interest and principal. When will it get the interest? Okay. When will it get the principal? Okay. Assume that the business model of that entity is to collect contractual cash flows from that particular asset. Okay. So remember the word business model. Okay. And remember the word contractual cash flow. So you define what a contractual cash flow is for me. The business model is entities return risk management policy which essentially says what will I do with that asset. Okay. Can a company have a risk management policy for one asset? No. It may be having a policy for a type of assets right? or a bucket of assets or a portfolio of assets and therefore remember that the business model test is at a level which is higher than the instrument level and therefore it would be at a level which is a bit higher than the instrument level exactly so in this particular case okay if the company's business model is to hold similar type of instruments and collect cash either out of interest or principal then that company's default classification for that debt instrument is amortized cost okay which comes to the second question in terms of if that is the business model and that is how i have classified that asset what would happen and can i sell that asset So if I sell the asset then what happens? So what the standard says is if there are infrequent sales of small quantities or infrequent times of sales of large quantities okay, then it is allowed under this business model test. So let me give you an example. Okay. Let's assume this company has got government of India bonds and it is going to come up with an expansion plan in three years time for which it needs the cash and therefore for three years it is going to hold it and after three years when it needs the cash or you know there has not been envisaged at the time when it invested. It is envisaged, let's assume, three years down the line, it needs to invest in a plan, and that is a point in time it is going to withdraw that cash or sell that instrument and get money out of that instrument to invest in a plan. So, that is an infrequent timing as far as selling is concerned, but it's maybe large in value because the business model test not only applies for one instrument but applies for a bucket full of instruments of similar nature, and therefore, in this particular case. The business model test still holds good, right? 
let's take another example let's assume i have mutual funds okay i invest in mutual funds and what do i do is any excess cash i have received through my operations or any excess cash which i have which i have not deployed in operations which i have got from my borrowings i invest in mutual funds and my business model is not only to collect contractual cash flows but also to sell those assets in order to meet my day to day liquidity needs so it may be not be that i may be selling all my mutual funds today i may be selling my mutual funds on a regular basis daily basis weekly basis monthly basis i don't know but what i am going to do is i am going to liquidate that mutual fund and again redeploy it in my operations so is the contractual cash flows to collect interest and principal yes maybe but it is also to sell and the reason why i am selling is to meet my liquidity needs and therefore in that particular instance the standard says that the default classification of such an asset is fair value through oci i'll, I'll, I'll hold back your question I'll, i have not finished okay fair value through oci the reason why it cannot be at amortized cost is because for me to classify something at amortized cost by business model is only to collect contractual cash flows from principal and interest and provided there are certain exemptions in terms of infrequent sales which is happening because of the situation which is not envisaged it doesn't mean that if i hold an instrument i can't sell that instrument if that instrument is going to default for example instead of a government of india bond let's assume i have a kingfisher bond i am not going to hold that instrument unless and until you know that instrument becomes defunct right so if a credit default event happens where a downgrade happens and if i sell because of a credit default event of that issuer then again it will not hamper the business model test classification now coming back to where the contractual cash flows plus selling is what your business model is because you are meeting that to meet your liquidity needs then the default classification is fair value through oci but take an example where i have the same mutual funds and i purchase and sell those mutual funds in order for me to maximize my yield somebody is giving me 5 paise additional and placing an order selling it purchasing something else tomorrow somebody else is giving me 5 paise additional what am i doing over here i am maximizing my yield so the reason why i am selling that mutual fund is not to meet my liquidity needs but to maximize my yield and therefore the default classification in that particular instance is fair value through pnl right so it's very important to understand where i need to classify something as for a debt instrument if it is at amortized cost <coughs> the interest will come to pnl the impairment charges on the debt instrument will come to pnl any gains and losses on sale will come to pnl and any foreign exchange gains and losses assuming that the debt instrument is in a foreign currency will come to pnl no for something which is classified at amortized cost for an instrument which is classified at fair value through oci the same logic applies and therefore except the fair value change the interest the impairments the foreign exchange gains and losses and the gain or loss on sale everything will get recycled to pnl oci is where the fair value gains and losses do not hit pnl but is parked separately in a separate component of equity called other comprehensive income yes but as far as these four items are concerned effective interest rate impairment foreign exchange gains and losses these three will hit to pnl irrespective of what the classification is 
as far as debt instruments are concerned either amortized cost or fair value through oci the other fair value changes will remain put in oci and will be recycled to pnl at the time when the sale happens right as far as debt instruments are concerned absolutely sort of fair value fluctuation does correct ignoring the default classification in both the criterias you can for these debt instruments go to fair value option and therefore classified as instruments at fair value through pnl so that is an option which is available to you so you're clear about what is amortized cost what is uh, fair value through oci and fair value through pnl okay now okay let's talk about equity instruments as far as equity instruments are concerned the default for any equity instrument is i can't apply the contractual cash flow characteristics test neither can i apply the business model test because i don't know when i am going to get the contractual cash flow in this right so the default for an equity instrument which i am holding as an asset is fair value through pnl so every equity instrument will necessarily be fair value through pnl which means i need to fair value every equity instrument to pnl i am not talking about equity instrument which is held in the separate financial statements of the parent which is that equity instrument being a subsidiary joint venture or an associate a subsidiary joint venture and associate in the separate financial statements of the parent could be classified at par value i am talking about a cfs financial statements where there are equity instruments which is apart from what is subsidiary associates and joint ventures correct either trade unquoted quoted everything is par value to pnl and when this came in there was a lot of hue and cry said i mean you are asking us to classify everything at pnl and there be huge fluctuations in equity what are we going to do and then therefore you know the companies came out with a ton of bricks on the isb and said no no this is not acceptable and therefore isb paying heed to all these companies said fine if fair value through pnl is not acceptable we will give you one more option fair value through oci okay so nevertheless you would need to do the fair value but you fair value through oci but that is an option which you need to take at the time of initial recognition that means for companies in india the initial recognition is either on the date of recognition or 1st april 2015 because that's the date of the opening balance sheet and going forward any initial recognition of the asset when you have purchased that asset and therefore they gave that option but they were smart they said that fine if you take the fair value through oci option okay except dividends nothing will come to pnl that means a dividend which is given by the company will come to pnl impairment will get recorded in oci of that equity instrument any gain loss on sale will also be recycled from oci directly to retain earnings absolutely absolutely so if it never gets comes to pnl we are not clear in terms of what is going to happen in mat if mat is what is going to get notified as per the companies act and companies act is what is this then it will never come into mat as well if you look into the icds icds talks about mark to market losses it doesn't talk about gains <coughs> no nothing they have they have just closed all the classifications and said for equity instruments the default category is fair value through pnl if you are not able to achieve fair value through pnl if you don't want fair value through pnl 
you irrevocably opt for an option of fair value through OCI and if it is fair value through OCI what will come to PNL is only dividends nothing else comes to PNL impairment losses don't come to PNL even gain loss and sale won't come to PNL no it's, it, it is not right for equity instruments there is no business model because there is no contractual cash flows correct the contractual cash flow test and the business model test is only for debt not for equity. Yeah. I, I told you, if that is the case, it's fair value through PNL, a mutual fund which is kept on buying and selling for the purposes of yield maximum. Pardon? No, it will be fair value through PNL. The default category is fair value through PNL. It's a debt instrument, right? Sorry, didn't understand. Equity, the default category is fair value through PNL. For debt, you need to understand what is the business model and the contractual cash flow characteristic test is. If it is for yield maximization, it can't go into amortized cost, it can't go into fair value through OCI. It has to come to PNL. If it is for the purposes of liquidity and therefore I sell, it can go to fair value through OCI. If it is at amortized cost, it will be amortized cost. I will just answer his questions. So you have to have three business models. Obviously practically a company cannot have one business model, right? So you need to identify on 31st of March 2015, which instruments fall under which business model. And then at the time, each instrument you record after purchase, then you start needing to allocate that to that business model. Yeah, because practically it is not possible for a company to have one business model. It is acceptable to have two business models. No, you can't. Your business model, does your organization's memorandum and also articles of association change from time to time? No, it's a business model. How do I want to do business? Let's assume that, you know, I am in the business of selling loans. Okay. Suddenly, I also think that I should also be in the business of purchasing distressed loans. That is a change in the business model. So I am not only originating loans which is of good quality, but also I am originating loans or purchasing loans which are distressed and therefore are of a substandard quality. So that is a change in business model. Yes, that could be a change. There has to be a change in business model for you to reclassify something. My underlying purpose of that particular model should change. And therefore that needs to be an event which needs to happen for that change. Does that, does that answer your question? Correct. Correct. Yeah, so I mean, it cannot change overnight. There has to be a change in the business model, the way management perceives for you. That is why the standard allows you to have two business models, but you can't keep reshuffling between two business models. Pardon? Dividend is issued in the form of a dividend is issued in the form of a financial instrument. Still, how will you record that financial instrument? Where will the credit go? Uh, double entry. Double entry has to be that there has to be a credit. No, credit will go to P and L. The only thing is you need to understand whether it is a return of investment or return on investment. If it's a return of investment, it will go through your investment. If it's a return on investment, it will go to PNL. So that 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 is your come dividend and ex dividend price when you purchase any investments, right? Correct.
correct how I, I i will tell you how it is currently being done let's assume that i have a loan okay and that loan is going bad the banker comes and says that you know look the loan is going bad what do i do so the company says no no you know we will restructure and we will pay you in 10 years and convert that loan into a debenture but from a from a banker perspective from an investor perspective i will still treat that even though the legal form is a debenture for the purposes of recording my impairment i'll still treat that as a loan and see as to whether i'll be able to recover and then do so a restructuring doesn't change the classification of the loan from bad to good all right i'm not going to go through this uh, examples uh, because uh, i've explained the concept i'll go through one afna started at 10:30 so this is something which i explained to you as to when will transaction cost apply and when will transaction cost not apply if it is at fair value through pnl no transaction cost should be fair valued but if it is at amortized cost then the transaction cost would be applicable so amortized cost fair value through oci equity instruments and fair value through pnl uh unfortunately the standard does not give you an exemption for uncoated equity instruments so even uncoated equity instruments would need to get fair value so there's going to be a big big uh, uh effort which would be required on part of companies to value uncoated equity instruments if you look at the standard which was there earlier under ifrs the reason why that exemption was given for uncoated equity instruments was because the range in the fair values for an uncoated equity instrument could be very for example look into let's assume somebody wants to uh, uh, value tata sons i mean tata sons is an amalgam of various companies in which it holds shares so if you place can you place a single value to that share and therefore there could be different values and therefore the old standard said that the range in the fair values is very different then you can value it at cost but this doesn't give you the exemption of not valuing uncoated equity instruments and therefore even uncoated equity instruments would need to be fair valued but it gives you certain options that if these options are not there then you can value it at uncoated equity instruments at cost for example if there is no significant change in the budgets versus planned cash flows of that uncoated equity instrument now what i don't understand is why this particular paragraph was given because let's assume you hold only 1 or 2% shares in the entity how will you have access to their budgets for you to conclude whether the budgets to actual cash flows is okay or not okay so in those particular instances it's it's you know again that's that's the reason why you need to have application guidance as far as the standard is concerned and when india is adopting this standard the majority of the things which they would be hit by is the principal versus liability classification and is uncoated equity instruments because there is no complex instruments in the market which rbi allows you to value the you know rbi you know does a lot of research before they come out with instruments in the market and therefore there will be very less complex instruments but what where you could find possible areas of complexity is liability versus equity because all these are issued in the past and it could impact any company and second is is uncoated investments because you could have investments in your subsidiary in pe entities all of them could be uncoated and when you have to value these at fair value it could potentially pose a fair value challenge to you yes 
no idea no idea comparable companies comparable companies you can i mean flipkart is not quoted in the market still its valuation is available snapdeal is not quoted in the market still its valuation is available that's where all your all the valuation work will come through right yeah so you need to look into what is the size what is the market premium so obviously then if if you start valuing these there will be a level lot of unobservable inputs in this and therefore the valuation of this could be level 3 instruments and therefore as an auditor what then you would need to see is whether you would need to get an emphasis of matter paragraph saying that there are certain instruments which have been valued at fair value and bring the reader to the attention that these instruments are at fair value and these are level 3 instruments but you can't avoid not doing a fair value embedded derivatives we discussed uh, uh pretty much for a lot of this for an equity instrument it just eliminates the embedded derivative and also for debt instruments if there are prepayment options etc if those prepayment options are not closely related it again eliminates the question of separating out the embedded derivatives because by doing fair value through pnl everything is at fair value subsequent measurement of financial liabilities subsequent measurement of financial liabilities could be either at uh, amortized cost or at fair value uh, there is no other classification as far as financial liabilities is concerned uh, if an instrument is quoted in the market uh, companies can choose to classify it at fair value through pnl which means that everything will go to pnl uh, but as far as uh, 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 amortized cost is concerned you would record that at the price at which you would need to repay that liability towards the end of maturity the only thing is uh, if an instrument is classified at fair value through pnl there are two aspects to the fair value one aspect of that fair value is a credit risk and if any changes in credit risk is there that <coughs> would need to be taken to fair value through oci so only the credit risk component so let me take an example to explain this to you okay i have issued a liability let's assume i have issued a non convertible debenture okay i have issued a ncd and that ncd is classified as a liability that ncd is quoted in nse right now the price at which i have issued this is 100 initially the nsc is uh, at the ncd is also quoted at 100 in the market now because of a fall in my credit rating the price of the ncd at a reporting period has come to 90 okay if you are classified at fair value through pnl what would happen there would be again there would be again it's counter intuitive right i mean my credit risk is going down i have a liability and there is a gain pardon exactly and during the credit crisis in 2008 a lot of banks had classified this at fair value through pnl and they recorded 500 600 1 billion worth of gain in their pnl and therefore india's 109 says that if because of your credit risk going down there is a gain then don't take that gain to pnl but take it to oci your liability would still be valued at 90 but that 10 will go to oci rather than pnl so that's a change from the old indias 39 or is 39 again sort of examples which i will not uh, specifically address uh reclassification we discussed that only when there is a change in the business model that you will be able to reclassify and that business model changes needs to be at a very high level 
can't be in by instrument by instrument. That actually needs to be a change in the way you are doing business for you to reclassify something from one category to another category for financial assets. No reclassification of financial liabilities is permitted. And no reclassification of something which you are classified under equity at fair value through OCI. It's an irrevocable option. So if you are classified an equity instrument at fair value through OCI, gone. What can be the impact? You can't, you can't reclassify it. That's the impact. So any gains and losses on sale will stay put in OCI and will be recycled to retain earnings. It will get transferred to retain earnings. <laughs> so that is the anti-abuse provision which they have introduced in the standard. So you, you wanted an option to classify something at OCI because you didn't want the P&L to get hit. Fine. We won't hit the P&L. But on sale, you can't recognize the gain. Transfer it to retain earnings. That's the anti-abuse provision. All right. Uh, again, I'll briefly explain uh, what is derecognition. Uh, derecognition is when you remove a financial asset or a financial liability from the balance sheet. So, derecognition is when the following three condition is satisfied. Contractual obligation towards liabilities, cash flows extinguished, which means that I have a debt. The debt is to maturity and the maturity is come through and therefore I get the sale proceeds, I reverse my investments, right? So that is when the contractual cash flows expire for that instrument, okay? Asset is transferred and transfer qualifies for derecognition and third is contractual right to assets cash flow expire. So contractual rights to assets cash flow expire is similar to where the contractual rights to cash flows extinguish. The important point to remember over here is asset is transferred and transfer qualifies for derecognition. I will explain a simple example to you to explain this concept. Okay, uh, Please, and this again applies only for financial assets. So we are talking derecognition of financial assets first. Okay, Let's assume that I have taken a, you know, this is a financial institution. This is a financial institution and the financial institution, let's assume, is written credit card loans, which means that my counterparty is who? A customer. And what is he supposed to pay to me? Credit card EMIs. Okay. Or let's assume instead of credit card, let me take an example of a personal loan. Okay. Now, how do I show that in the balance sheet? Loans. Right? When do the contractual cash flows to that loan expire? When that loan is repaid. Right? When does the contractual cash flows to the loan cease? When he prepays it. Correct? Let's assume that I want cash. Because I am I am a financial institution, I'm constantly in the business of taking borrowings and then writing loans. I need cash. So what do I do is okay. I take a pool of loans. Let's assume all personal loans given to people who are staying in Park Street. Okay. Do you think the credit quality of those loans probably could be higher? Okay. So I take all these pool of loans originated in the year 2015 and sell it to a securitization vehicle. Once I sell this loan to a securitization vehicle, Okay, what happens is I still collect cash flows from that loan because the vehicle doesn't know who the customers are. I still collect cash flows from that loan and pay that cash flows back to the securitization vehicle. So this is nothing but a vehicle which I have introduced in between. Now under Indian Gap, the existing Indian Gap, if I have legally transferred the cash flows to that vehicle, okay, then I can derecognize that and show that as a 
contingent liability now under indas you would need to pass something called as a risk and rewards model now what happens is in this particular instance when i have securitized these loans what i need to do is i need to see what was the risk inherent in that loan which i have securitized so in this particular case let's assume that all these personal loans which the bank has taken okay so for every 100 rupees worth of loan 1% defaults okay 1% that means on a 100 rupee worth of loan i have 1 rupee as bad debt so that is the risk which i have in that loan portfolio okay if 1 rupee is the bad debt which i have in the loan portfolio which i have written to the securitization vehicle what you need to see is at what price i have sold that loan to that securitization vehicle let's assume i have sold that loan at 100 but i also place the deposit or i have given a guarantee which is 5% of that loan amount so if you look into the economics of the transaction if i had kept that loan i would have suffered a 1% default okay i have sold that loan but i have given a 5% guarantee which means that the bank can come back for 5 rupees worth of default to me and therefore have you transfer the risk and rewards what is the risk and rewards in that loan worth 100 the risk in that loan of 100 is 1 have you transferred that risk of 1 to the securitization vehicle you still have a risk of 5 and therefore this loan does not meet the de recognition test so the amount which you are going to receive from the customer worth 100 would be shown as a loan and the amount which you have received from the securitization vehicle worth 100 would be shown as a secured borrowing in your financial statements and therefore both the loan as well as the borrowing would be shown in the balance sheet on a gross basis so that is the essence of the risk and rewards model under the securitization transaction so any factoring arrangements which you have for receivables please evaluate all those factoring arrangements which now you have been showing is contingent liabilities to see what is the kind of arrangements which you have what are the risks in that arrangement and how do you then classify this or de recognize or recognize re recognize this in your balance sheet in type of securitization where there are least receivables also but least receivables essentially uh, will not fall under the standard what will fall under the standard is loans what will fall under the standard is trade receivables which you have factored so all that will fall under the standard yeah all the more no was your initial default rate 6% and your guarantee 5% no if a initial default is that is at the time when you transfer again that assessment would be need to be made at the time when you transfer say if it is 1% and what you are given as deposit is only 5% is 5% majority of the cases from practice in india they don't meet the de recognition test because the banks will not allow you to get away with not giving any guarantee or not giving any deposits money placed in the money market you are talking about repo and reverse repos yeah. yeah so repo and reverse repo again will not meet the de recognition test under indas so the amount which you have taken as borrowings will be shown under the head borrowings and the investments which you have placed would be shown under investments and let's assume that you have given an advance okay and you have got investments in return then that investments will not be shown but that advance would be shown as a repo or a reverse repo similar to your securitization it won't meet the de recognition test even under indian gap it doesn't meet the de recognition test right repo and reverse repos you still show it as a secured borrowing or a lending it will be similar 
all right i uh, i won't go through this uh, in detail because this is what i exactly explained to you the recognition of financial liabilities when it is discharged when it is cancelled or when it is expired okay so if you are trying to uh, uh, you know again as far as the financial liability is concerned it should be legally extinguished or you have repaid or it is discharged which means the creditor is discharged you from the obligations in only these three circumstances can you de recognize the liability so if you have a sales tax incentive deferral loan okay which you have received from the government at let's assume 0% interest rate and that you are trying to sell to an institution and that institution essentially doesn't legally discharge you that means that as far as you are concerned the government says that you are the person who is going to pay i have no no correlation with the amount which you are going to take from the government then again you have not discharge the liability okay so i am talking about typical situations where it could arise as far as india is concerned can yeah uh, these are simplistic examples you can go through this i just wanted to touch briefly on impairment uh as far as india is concerned uh again there is a lot of history as far as impairment is concerned uh the history is that if you look into the old standard the old standard essentially talked about impairment when there is a incurred loss event which happened the new standard talks about an event when there is an expected loss event which is going to happen so it's moving away from an incurred loss event and is going to an expected loss event to give an example let's assume that a customer defaults on a personal loan that is the time when the bank should start making provisions on that loan and take a situation where now instead when there is no default which has happened still banks would need to make a provision so that is an expected loss event and that is taken into consideration at the time when you record a provision and this is one of the significant changes which has happened from is 39 to indas 109 or ifrs uh, is 39 to ifrs 9 or indas 109 and what it essentially says is that you would need to make a provision essentially when you write a financial instrument or when you are party to a financial asset right so you are going away from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model so you no longer need to make a provision at the time when you have incurred that loss but you start making that provision based on an expected loss okay which means that how does the company start doing this particular aspect so when does how does the company do this so i will again take a example of a personal loan okay let's assume that i have written a loan worth 1000 and this loan is repayable in 4 years 250 every year by the customer correct now when i have written that loan okay the amount which i am going to get in year 1 is 250 year 2 year 2 250 year 3 250 year 4 250 so the cash flows of the loan is 1000 divided into 250 of each years under the old model i will start making provision for that loan when somebody defaults on that particular installment of 250 
So let's assume there is four yearly installments of 250. Somebody defaults, that is the time I would start making a provision. So assuming that the customer has paid the first installment of 250, no provisions. Assuming second installment of 250 is paid, no provisions. Third installment is not paid, that is the time I would start making provisions. Now under the expected loss model, what you actually go and do is, you estimate at the time you have written the loan that how many customers are going to default in year 1, how many customers are going to default in year 2, how many customers are going to default in year 3, how many customers are going to default in year 4. Now you will be wondering how do you start making that assessment. You start making that assessment by going back into history. That let's assume if I am standing as of 2016, I go back to 2011, which means that 2011 personal loan would have got matured in 2015. So I go back into 2011 and see that a loan which got originated in 2011, how many installments have defaulted in the first year? How many installments are defaulted in the second year? How many installments are defaulted in the third year? How many installments are defaulted in the fourth year? How many loan contracts? How much is the amount? Once I have that data, then I start making provisions based on an expected loss model under the standard. The first bucket under the expected loss model is called the stage one model. And in this, what I do is, I make a provision for what is going to default in the next 12 months. Let's assume that out of 100 contracts which I have written in year 1, which is year 0, 10 contracts is going to default in year 1. That means the probability of default is 10%. And if 10 contracts are going to default in year 1, then what is the total amount which I will not get back? Let's assume I will not get back 50% of the amount. So the amount of provision which I would need to make at year 0 is 100 contracts multiplied by 10,000 would be a total value of the loan. The total amount of provision which I would need to make is 10 contracts multiplied by total value of the loan multiplied by 50%. And that will hit day 1. So what are you doing actually with this? You are shifting your impairment from the time it is incurred to the time at day 0. And therefore, this is a significant amount of change which is going to happen to financial institutions. Imagine the impact it's going to have on their impairment. Imagine the impact which is going to have on systems, processes, controls. Because you need to go back, you can't take one year average, right? So you have to wait 2011 to 15, 2010 to 14, 2009 to 12, 2008 to 7. <coughs> and it also needs to factor in the current economic cycle. 2008 may be similar to 2014, 2004 may not be similar to 2014. So you have to, so that is the reason why RBI has not implemented, I have, the reason why RBI has not implemented India's is precisely because of the fact that is India ready to go into India's. The question is, what happens to NBFCs? which do not fall under the exemption because they are a parent of a company which is not an NBFC. For them, they have to follow this and imagine the impact it will have because it will be very very different to the provisions which RBI has been having currently. This, if you hear about the second bucket, the second bucket is even more dangerous. What the second bucket is, it says that let's assume that out of 100 loans which I have written in year 0, 20 loans go bad at any point in time from origination till maturity. So the probability of default is 20% and therefore once it migrates from stage 1 to stage 2 then what would happen is the entire provisions on that loans would need to be made. That means the probability of default increases from 10 to 20 multiplied by let's assume 50% of the loans is what is recoverable as cash flows. So you would need to make that much amount of additional provision and believe me or not the default event okay, is defined in the standard 
as 30 days overdue. So as soon as a loan becomes 30 days overdue, it automatically shifts from stage 1 to stage 2. So that is the last. So companies who need to transition from stage 1 to stage 2 before, but anyway it cannot be later than 30 days overdue. And therefore, for NBFCs, this is going to be a significant amount of impact. For trade receivables, companies in manufacturing industry probably may not be. Because, you know, an event of default as far as a trade receivable could happen maybe because of specific situations. For example, you know, somebody going bankrupt or there may be a dispute in an invoice and therefore somebody may not be paying. Correct? Or you are push loans or receive sales to that particular entity. So those could be reasons which could be very specific. But what could get impacted in this particular thing is NBFCs who need to prepare consolidated, who need to prepare financial statements because a parent would need it. Because for them the amount of impact on this could be significant. And stage 3 is when an incurred loss event happens. And that is an event of default. Correct? Intercorporate deposits again not very significant, right? From a from a balance sheet perspective and a manufacturing entity, loans could not be that significant. What could be significant is for an NBFC. In a trade receivable, I don't see a significant impact coming through because of impairments. But NBFCs definitely yes. Alright, so I'll not uh, I just explained all these examples. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this in significant detail. Uh, so the requirements also contain a rebuttable presumption that the credit risk has increased significantly when contractual payments are more than 30 days past due. So this is what I explained. And transfer from stage 2 to stage 3 is when it is 90 days past due. So it's a rebuttable presumption that if it is 90 days past due, it automatically means a incurred loss event has happened. So they again define quantitative thresholds which we need to be careful about. No, no car works. Restructuring means that the loan is NPA. Restructuring means what? You are saying that I have not lost hope on you. Okay? I have restructured the terms. You still got time, you pay me. But as far as you know, I am concerned, you know, the situation of the borrower doesn't change because I have restructured. No, you can't. Going forward, not not today. <coughs> what am I doing with restructuring? I am saying that you know it is due today. Okay, you pay me one year down the line, two year down the line. What you are supposed to pay in some equal installments? Correct. So yeah, so that means I am forgiving something. So the amount which I am forgiving anyway should be provided for. Correct. Irrespective. Irrespective, because. My ability currently to pay doesn't change because of that as a as an invest as a as a borrower. The reason why I have restructured, that is why restructuring as far as INDAS is concerned, is very similar to an impact. The only thing is I, I monitor that separately because I have entered into a contractual relationship to restructure, but it essentially doesn't change anything as far as the credit quality of that loan is concerned. If I have a negative credit rating of that loan and if I give securitization to that, who is going to purchase that thing? Let's assume that a loan worth rupees 100 is purchased at 50. Anyway, that 50 would need to be recorded as impairment. That 50 again which you are selling, again would need to be checked for derecognition. Probably it will not meet the derecognition. So you will have 50 of loan and 50 of borrowings. No, that, uh, that is the reason why this is not available, right? Because the prudential norms is under Indian GAAP. 
correct the rbi prudential norms is under indian capital question question we need to ask is that if let's assume that you know this standard is now embedded in companies act if rbi doesn't come out with anything which is contrary to what is there then this standard will override what is there in rbi unless and until somebody comes out with a separate evaluation as far as nbfcs is concerned what they need to do for consolidation but when rbi comes out rbi will come out with its own stand alone financial statements these nbfcs will not be required to prepare stand alone financial statements they are preparing financial statements for inclusion in cfs and in cfs if you need to say that you have prepared the financial statements in accordance with indas then this is the standard which you need to apply so prudential norms is applicable for what prudential norms is applicable for stand alone financial statements not for somebody who is preparing a cfs will hit unless and until some clarification as of now it will get hit that is the answer yes uh do we we have to stop all right the only thing which uh, uh i have not covered over here is hedge accounting i'll just cover in the next 5 minutes quickly uh what is there in hedge accounting uh again three types of hedges uh as far as hedge accounting is concerned but something which is uh, uh not widely seen in an indian scenario uh the three types of hedges are cash flow hedges fair value hedges and net investment hedges uh cash flow hedges essentially hedge the variability in the cash flows of a particular entity and uh, net investment hedges are essentially where uh uh you have a borrowing let's assume you have taken for the purposes of acquisition and that borrowing you are is a foreign currency borrowing which you are essentially uh marking to market at the closing rate that foreign currency borrowing in your financial statements marking to market at closing rate is going to pnl whereas the money which you have invested in that subsidiary and its translation essentially hits translation reserve in oci because your presentation currency is inr so you have a mismatch where your borrowing goes to pnl and where your translation of your foreign currency assets and liabilities if it is non integral if the functional currency is different goes to oci then you can designate this borrowing in a hedging relationship with that and therefore the borrowings gain and loss which you are taking to pnl on foreign exchange will hit your translation reserve and that is something called as a net investment hedge the third is called a fair value hedge okay uh, so those are the three types of uh, hedges which you have and there are certain instruments which you can hedge it with and there are certain hedging relationships which you can enter uh, but considering that we don't have time uh, what i need to do is uh, pause at the moment uh you can go through the uh, slides on hedge accounting uh but what i actually wanted to cover in this entire session was basic recognition of financial assets and liabilities because that is something which affects all the companies uh classification because that's something which you are going to find pervasive throughout each of the organizations and then essentially your classification of financial assets and liabilities those those are some things which you will always find impairment i briefly touched upon in terms of how this is going to affect hedge accounting again not something which is uh, uh, seen pervasively throughout a lot of organizations because uh, the documentation is onerous and contemporaneous uh, and uh, uh, you know i would be more than willing to come and take hedge accounting as a separate session which may probably go on for a couple of hours <laughs> so uh, yeah Yeah. Uh, yes, the the future contract is a derivative, and if you want to hedge, it will get covered under the hedge accounting. If you want to hedge it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yes, it could be classified as a cash flow hedge if you want to enter into that, if you want to designate that future contract. So let's assume that I am going to purchase 100,000 barrels oil. Okay, and I entered into a future contract to purchase 100,000 barrels of oil. So in this particular case, if I want to fix the price, I would have entered into a future contract. So that future contract, I could designate in a cash flow hedge to purchase $100,000 worth of oil and therefore uh, it could be designated as a cash flow hedge and the gain or loss in that future contract which should have been taken to P&L would now be taken to OCI and when that barrel comes in as inventory, the gain or loss on that derivative will be adjusted to inventory. Five value through PNL. Yes. Because you are not collecting contractual cash flows. Let's assume you have a zero coupon bond which is issued at 70 and I'm going to get 100 rupees. That 30 is nothing but contractual cash flows. But what I'm going to get at the end of year 5 is something which is based on index. It's not contractual cash flows. It's clear? Fair value through PNL. I think we need to we can we can take that separately if you want so uh, i think i need to stop at this moment uh, but uh, there's no time afterwards right in terms of in lunch yeah all right so thank you so much uh, and uh, thank you so much for listening